So just to introduce you to me, I'm Sarah and I like structure. <laughs> and uh, those of you that know me, I kind of like chaos. Uh, <laughs> sometimes if you have too much structure, then you lose the ability to be inclusive with, with what your audience is bringing you. Yeah, Kyle, but with too much chaos, you lose your chance to convey full concepts. True. So here are the goals that Kyle and I would like to meet during this time together. Uh, we'd like to really encourage active listening for all of you. Uh, we've all done a million planetarium shows by this point, or at least several hundred, and maybe that's a part of our brain that needs uh, reworking again. I know mine did, for sure. Uh, willingness to be creative is encouraged, of course, always. And the courage to have no fear when it comes to trying to do something new with your shows, your live programs. Um, of course, courage is not exactly the absence of fear, as I've always been told. Um, but one thing to always remind you whenever you do a show is that your audience does not have a clue what's coming next. So mess-ups or slip-ups may not actually be as obvious as you think they are, but they may have certain expectations from your program. So it's always good to remind you how to stay on target to cite uh, interesting interactions. And our target right now is we're going to do a live, improvised, uh, about 10-minute planetarium show together. And as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to be uh, flying some software. Uh, so you can feel free to uh, direct me, tell me what you want me to uh, be showing up in the sky. Uh, we're just going to start as a basic planetarium show starting on planet Earth during the daytime, move to nighttime, show a constellation maybe fly to a planet. Uh, the key thing is listen actively to what the presenter before you has said and do your best to try to move the story along. Um, now, if you want to be a presenter, we've got, I don't know, 30 or so people lined in uh, to the chat. Maybe not all of you want to present. If you want to be one of the presenters that Sarah calls on, uh, raise your digital hand. So that's Alt-Y if you want to be one of the people that uh, participate in this. Now, I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of you uh, have had experiences where somebody in your audience throws out some, some random comment. So our exercise today is going to be trying to find a way to incorporate those. And I'll be playing the character of the young kid in your audience who yells out those random comments. But I will call the next presenter uh, from the raised hands, like Kyle said, I will lower your hand when I do that just to know, hey, who have I already called on? Uh, you will then at that point, um, after I call on you, I say, hey, uh, so-and-so, and then I'll throw out my random comments. You will then take that, run with that random comment based on what's on the screen and also based on what's been said before. Keep that story moving forward. Um, in the chat, just in case you don't want to be a presenter and you'd rather just be that random chaotic audience member helping them out, uh, feel free to shout out some random comments in chat. Uh, just in case you have one, maybe you had the random comment yelled out in your shows and you just thought that it was crazy, chaotic, and it actually helped your show. Um, I'd like to hear some of those too. <laughs> We're already getting some there. That's great. Yeah, this is great. This is great. So, so your goal is to find a way to incorporate that into your show. Um, let's see, let me grab one here. Moose, okay, so here, here is a method that you could use. Repeat, reflect, and personalize, and then reset. So, moose. So, Patty, I, I hear you yelled out moose. You know, I, I am uh, a fan of animals. Before I got into the planetarium world, I, I worked in zoos, and our planet Earth is the only planet that we know of in our solar system that can support our kind of life. Everyone has to breathe and we have this uh, beautiful biosphere, small thin biosphere on the surface of our Earth that supports our type of life. Something like that. So the important thing is uh, be inclusive. Don't make anyone wrong. Try to find a way to make your audience member uh, Correct. All right. Yep. Any any questions before we get going? All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna disappear myself here. And we'll go ahead and get flying here. I'm gonna call on our first person, uh, and of course throw that random comment out there. 
John Erickson, is there alien life on Uranus? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, oh, I'm not sure I should have raised my hand with <laughs> when I saw that one. We got your back, John. What's that? You we got, got my, your back. You got my back? Yep. Um, well, did you print out, how did you pronounce that planet again? I was talking to Sarah. Well, That's, never mind. Uh, Uranus. Uh, well, let's fly to Uranus. Is that something you can do quickly, Kyle? Absolutely. Oh, we're leaving Earth. And as we heard with the moose comment, I see a biosphere with an atmosphere and clouds. I also saw water. I also saw ice. I saw oceans. So water, oceans, ice, atmosphere, clouds. How many of those things will we see when we get to the planet Uranus? Yeah, there's definitely clouds. It looks like an ocean. Zero it, moose. It does look, what's that? It I does look zero like moose, no moose. I didn't no see moose. a moose. Uh, do you see land? I don't see many features, so I guess it's hard to tell what is land and what is not. Do you see ice? Do you see clouds? All of the things we saw on Earth look very strange on Uranus. And if we're at Earth, Uranus, you know what we are? We're the aliens, because an alien is someone from somewhere else. And if we're at Uranus, we're from somewhere else. We're the aliens. Next. <laughs> hey, Catherine, uh, Doctor Who travels in time. I must unmute myself. Wow, Sarah, I actually love Doctor Who. Um, and he does travel in time. He also travels through space. Now, I can do both of those things here in the planetarium. So is there a time and place that you would like to visit in the galaxy? Ooh. My grandma's now a star. Can we visit there? Is it still me? Or are we going to the next person? Oh, we can go to the next person. Mary, my grandma's now a star. Can we visit there? Was that your grandma is a star? Was that the a star? My mom had told me. Oh, uh, well, there are lots of stars that we could potentially visit. I'm seeing one star that you all may be familiar with right in the center of the screen there. I don't know if you see it. It's very, very bright. I don't know if everyone knows the name of it. It's our closest star, the sun. Also, it looks like Kyle brought up some uh, lines for some groups of stars. Maybe your grandma is named after one of these groups of stars. These are the constellations that we can see in the sky. And let's see, I'm trying to look for particular ones. I see Gemini, I see a few other ones. And I do know one thing, my grandma bought me a star one time for my birthday. I don't know where it is, it's hard to find it, but maybe that's something that happened as well. <laughs> Hey, Ken, me and my family saw Comet Neowise last week. Excellent. Comet Neowise is very easy to find in the sky now. If you look in the northwest after sunset, about an hour after the sun goes down or appears to set, um, you, you look in the northwest right below the Big Dipper, you should be able to see Comet Neowise in the sky. It will help if you have a pair of binoculars um, to find it at first and then try and get catch it with your neighbor with your unaided eyes but it's um it's getting dimmer so it's getting a little bit harder to see and the other thing that's getting in the way is the moon the moon is starting to get very bright in the sky now and so it may, will make uh neowise harder to see so that's why that's why you want to have a pair of binoculars if you can get them to look at neowise awesome all right we need some more hands raised here that was the last hand that was raised that i see on the participants list unless I'm missing someone here so I might just call somebody rank by random. Y'all ready?
All right, no one's raising their hand. So, hey, Alan, I think space smells. Uh, what makes you think that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's something that you might think of because uh, astronauts who have gone up into space may have come back pretty smelly. Now, that brings us to the whole question of how would you take a shower in space? Can you take a shower in space? Um, what do you think? Yes. What would, be, <laughs> what would be the problems with trying to take a shower in space? I'm going to let somebody else answer that one. It. I think we need an astronaut here to tell us about that. I've heard that they uh, use sponges or something like that. Does anybody know? Hey, Krista, do you know? Well, I have this great YouTube video about an astronaut talking about how they do their uh, personal hygiene, brushing teeth and taking a shower. And yes, they do have specially like these washcloth things. Have you ever had like those towels that absorb lots of water? Kind of, and they use wet wipes too. Yep. So they do clean, but it's kind of hard. It's not a shower bath that you would have. All right, I found a comment earlier that was really, really great. Now I'm gonna toss this one to somebody else. Where'd he go? <laughs> okay, I guess I'm supposed to say they were taking spit showers if they're using one. Uh -huh. I don't think that would go over with Omaha people. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take us back home to planet Earth. And I wanna I want open up the discussion here about, um, I guess the first thing I, I want to ask is, how is how is the exercise that we did anything um, like an actual planetarium show that you've been involved with? And then maybe uh, the corollary to that is, is how is this different? So if you want to, if you want to uh, pop in, you can go ahead and unmute yourself for this. I think for me, how it's different is I don't have a um, driver and a presenter. So that, you know, makes it easy, but difficult because there was some lag time there between visuals. Mm, right, right. So when you're flying yourself, you know where you're going to go. And but so you was, can kind of preset that. Yeah, yeah. And then there was no like dead silent time as we're trying to fly there. Yeah. Did anyone else so find that this uh, sort of challenge their creative thoughts when it comes to material presented a uh, hundred times over? I guess I'll just jump in. Sure. I think it, it's tricky because uh, you don't get that, that um, visual feedback, or at least I don't get the same level of visual feedback that I get from an audience. So it's can be, it makes it more challenging for me, I think, to respond to people and, and connect what I'm saying to what was suggested. I noticed uh, Carol in the chat says that they've disabled chat for Zoom in your organization. Hmm. So you don't have the ability for people to uh, um, jump in live. Okay. Oh, I don't. You call on them and um, because they raise their hand in raise hand order and it's, it's always uh, a pain for them to be uh, unmuted and it, it lacks any sort of spontaneity. Mm. Yeah, interactivity is a lot harder to tease out in uh, the virtual programs. You have to... Um, Definitely be a fan of wait time. <laughs> you know, wait for responses to, to uh, brew and come up and then get typed out, especially if, you're using, if you are using chat, uh, because it takes time for a person to type a question, especially if it's, you know, many words. 
Yeah, in a planetarium show, a lot of times uh, you throw out a question to the audience and they immediately answer. But in a way, sometimes people take a little time to, to think and process anyway. So this might help us when we're finally back in our domes to slow down and give uh, you know, more people a chance to respond. Wait that seven seconds for them to think. Let me pop over here, speaking of chat, pop over here to the chat a little bit more. Uh, Patty, you said something about affirm how many cultures have creation stories, maybe even share one. Do you want to uh, say something about that? Someone had asked. Oh, you were answering Kyle, the Kyle yeah. Slayton prior, prior. Okay. Yeah, he had asked about how do you handle that, and you know, as teachers, we're not allowed to affirm any kind of religion. So, but you can't not affirm what they said. So, I always say yes, yes, you have a. You know, either your religion has it or just talk about how all these different cultures have a story of creation, whether it's God or animals, and you can bring up a whole bunch of different things. And that's kind of inclusive as well as affirming their their beliefs. So That's very true. I've, I've run across that situation one too many times, and it always makes me nervous. It, it never hasn't made me nervous to try to recognize them, recognize their voice, but not focus in on it. Mm -hmm. That's a tough one. And Carrie mentioned that people have been trained to just watch screens rather than interact. And, and I, I agree. I've actually had, when I've done live planetarium shows using Zoom, I've had a much higher success rate when I've been working with younger kids. They're more likely to, to pop in, I've found. What, what are some experiences that other people have tried uh, live interactive shows online? What are some experiences you've had? So this is John Armstrong from the Op Planetarium. We've been running some uh, virtual planetarium shows through uh, Facebook Live. Uh, and the only issue with those is that there's often like a five or six minute lag time on the on the chat so so i have my staff a couple of my students monitor the chat window while i'm talking because i don't see their comments until five minutes after i've talked about something um so it's it's nice because you don't have to worry about being zoom bombed or <laughs> anything like that um, but you do have to have somebody on your side to kind of monitor the chat and answer questions um, and then you can kind of clean up after you're done um, but yeah we've been doing those so you're, you're broadcasting live to Facebook and then uh, the interaction is all through Facebook. So That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Which, yeah. I mean, that has its own problems, but since these have been for, they've been to replace our uh, summer public shows, which were always mm -hmm. open to everybody. They weren't for school groups. Um, I know if you're working with schools, I don't think Facebook's a good option uh, for lots of reasons, but. Yeah. I, has anyone done live shows just with Zoom or something where you have any kind of uh, immediate interaction with an audience? Who's been doing those things? I have, but they've been like private reserve groups like Girl Scouts or um, summer school programs. I've done just a couple of them. Um, but I had like a format. I was going with like a PowerPoint and then I was using Stellarium and so it was structured, but I, I had to get the um, counselor to monitor the chats because I'm doing all these other things at the same time. Yeah, it's a lot of different tech things to keep your eyes on at <laughs> once, it's true. Um, this is Christine, and we're going to talk tomorrow about some of the programs we've been doing. Um, but in them, we have done live. Uh, we use Ring Central, which is basically Zoom. Um, and we've uh, done pre registration, so that way we know who's coming. It gives us a better idea, just like for this conference. Um, and But there's usually more than one of us. So, like, like you said, Kyle, one of us can observe the chat um, while we're talking, while we're showing things, and we integrate activities with it as well that we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Are most people when you're doing your shows um, essentially pre-recording and sending it out or doing something that is um, where there's a 
a bit of a barrier or lag time, such as such as what was mentioned uh, earlier about Facebook Live. So this is this is John Armstrong, and I we've been doing a little bit of both. I've been having uh, we've been preparing some um, videos that go along with some of the activities we've been sending out. But I I think it's interesting what I've noticed with doing anything on Zoom or anything with my classes that when you ask questions, often it's dead silence for a long time before people are, I think people are waiting, they don't want to talk over each other. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've noticed I've, I've had to wait a really long time if I am doing sort of any interactions um, because someone will usually ask a question if you wait long enough, it's just a lot longer than in person. And it's very, it makes me uncomfortable to just sit there quietly for quite some time. <laughs> Part of the trick with part of the trick with that would be the uh, what what would be questioning strategies. I mean, you would always want to start out with a really easy one, you know, that yeah. would just really people would answer easily, um, and then move to something harder. Get them get them into the idea that they can actually speak. This is Rick Felderman. And I just want to compliment what Alan said and say easy and motivating, interesting, something that they want to answer. I'm not even sure they care as much if they get the right answer, but they definitely need to want to answer it. Having it be easy can be a reason you, I want to answer something, but some people don't want to show off. They don't want to answer a question they know is easy. And so having a motivating question. Mm -hmm. And Richard, I think you mentioned something in there too that that I want to hit on is um, I think a lot of times when we do planetarium shows, we're looking for the right answer. And how do we how do we help an audience member who says the wrong answer if there is such a thing um, and bring so we don't exclude them for not knowing stuff that maybe they shouldn't have we shouldn't expect them to know before the planetarium show anyway. I ask the audience to do brainstorming with me, not answer questions. Uh, what do you, what do you think kinds of questions? And um, this idea of having the chat available and and saying you could put your question in the chat really deadens everything. So <laughs> I try to avoid the chat idea as much as possible if you're doing live. Um, just my thoughts. <laughs> No, I, I hear you. It kind of splits your brain that you're into multiple places that you have to uh, uh, try to track at this all at the same time. It's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, so one one technique that I will sometimes use is when I'm asking a question, and someone um, I try to make a habit of not stopping once I get the the right answer. If you're talking about right and wrong answers. Um, but try to take, you know, maybe one or two answers sort of beyond that and that um, that way it's not just like, well, I'm just looking for the right answer and whoever's got the right answer. Okay, now we move on. Um, but to say to demonstrate in that way that you're interested in people are uh, giving answers. And so you kind of take all of them. So if someone has a right wrong answer, you can sort of address that or, or you can just say that's an interesting idea, maybe and then take a few more answers and sort of circle back around. So um, yeah. but try not to um, I mean, this sounds a little bit harsh, but not to not to shame anyone into well, that's the wrong answer. Therefore, you know, if you if you if you're not sure of your idea, don't bother answering at all. But that we're trying to create an environment where you're welcome to to uh, to submit answers or, or to or to offer answers, and no judgment on if they're right or wrong. Um, but just be grateful that they're um, uh, that they're participating. Yeah. And that is what moves science forward is is wrong answers in a way if we if we all uh, memorize the facts and that's how we became scientists then <laughs> there wouldn't be very much progression and that over here says she's used uh, the zoom poll feature this thing I hadn't heard about actually before uh, to help catalyze um, like in interaction I have not seen that used myself have any of the rest of y'all used the Zoom poll? 
Yeah, Jack, Jack's presentation earlier uh, oh, right. talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. One other yeah. idea, uh, one other idea that got mentioned at the, at the LIPS e-conference um, a couple weeks ago was from Dave Cuomo about um, sort of that, going back to that, that question of sort of the lag time of, of questions when you ask a question and there's this long lag time is to, um, Dave Cuomo had, had a bit about how he was talking about how he kind of gives people sort of an idea of what he's about to talk about so that they can start thinking of questions uh, earlier so that when you are mm -hmm. ready to ask for, if there are questions, they're a little bit more ready and it's not just like on the spur of a moment, okay, you know, think, think of a question now. You ready now? Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, get them kind of thinking about it. And I think I saw earlier in the, the, the chat that Christine had put something um, similar to try to sort of um, prep people um, ahead of time to be to kind of be thinking about questions before you necessarily ask specifically for questions. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, maybe it inspires you a little bit to Try to find new ways of, of uh, incorporating your audience. Uh, and uh, be interested to get feedback from people on ways to improve this idea. So you can send me emails at kyle at digitaliseducation.com. And I'll type my uh, email into the, the chat here. Myself. Yeah, I didn't want to give you personal email out there, yeah. Sarah, so thank you. <laughs> I trust Thanks these everybody. Folks. You know what? I got, I got to say, I trust these folks. So you can also find my email on the IPS website so that should be available to everyone all right let's go ahead and hand it over i guess to the next presenter